the In Conversation podcast series with author Nigel Beckles. Welcome to the podcast. podcast. Please like the podcast, podcast. and subscribe podcast. to this channel. Podcast. Thank you. The very best way to promote your podcasts, Podpage makes it easy to create a podcast website with just a few clicks. Every page is optimized to be found on Google and it stays up to date forever. For more information visit podpage.com, the future of podcast promotion. Have you experienced several failed relationships or been through a divorce? How can you avoid making the same mistakes again? How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes is out now. Hi, my name is Nigel Beckles. My new book is packed with practical and common sense strategies that you can use to make better relationship choices. Now you can discover the dangerous myths about love. If your relationship expectations are realistic, why you could be falling in love for all the wrong reasons. How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes. It's a book that could change your life. Available from Amazon.co.uk. Kindle version also available. Get ready for takeoff. Welcome back to my In Conversation podcast series. My special guest for this episode is the founder of Pegasus Ops, an organization that deals with international abductions and the rescuing of children from countries all over the world. Jay Jordan. Hi, Jay. Welcome to my podcast series. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Very good to have you here. So where do you reside at the moment? I'm currently in Shropshire, UK. I understand you used to be a soldier in the British Army. What was your position and where did you serve? I reached the grand old heights of Lance Corporal. I joined the Army in 1998 and I left in 2004. Operationally, I served in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Sierra Leone and Iraq. And then non-operationally, I was in Cyprus, Gibraltar, um, the Falklands and Jordan. You created a company called Pegasus Ops or Pegasus Operations. When did you start your company and what does it do? So the company itself, there's a long story of how it all came about. But in 2012, I started working in child recovery. What I saw whilst I was working in child recovery is, first of all, a a lack of standards. There's a lack of organization. And there are a lot of individuals out there that are primarily in it for profit. I figured this out after about a year and a half of working for a company. And that sent me on a road where I wanted to actually make this into a free service or a cheap service um, or a cheaper service with a higher level of professionalism in it. So I came up with a concept in 2015. I got into a position in 2017 where one of these companies, they actually kidnapped a child from Cyprus. And that's when I took Pegasus live. And since then, we've just grown. Everything that we do, we actually locate and rescue missing children and kidnap children around the world. So quite complex in uh in the actual structure of the company. But what we're doing is working and numbers are obviously changing with us bringing these children home. So why were you motivated to create Pegasus Ops? Primarily because of what these companies are doing. First of all, there's families that can't afford to actually to give these cases out. Let's say their child gets kidnapped, whether that be a parent's abduction, whether that be kidnapped by an individual, whether they be groomed online to run away from home, or whether it be a runaway themselves or just a missing children and no one actually understands what those entities are because that goes into kidnap and ransom. That goes into a lot of different entities of why they've gone missing. But they can't afford to get a private entity involved to actually take on one of these cases because it can become very expensive. So I see that the companies that were working in this were take charging too much and taking advantage of the situation that these families were in. And they were profiting from it in the aspect of not giving out that professional service and having a very low success rate. So the work that I was doing after I left the military, I started contracting in the security industry. We've got high levels of professionalism in the security industry and the private military industry in itself. I decided to bring those levels into the child recovery industry. And then obviously combined with the low cost and the raising of donations for this, that gives families the knowledge now and the comfort now that they've got professionals going out looking for their children. So Jay, who are your clients and why do they approach you? Primarily, it's individual families. So parents, whether that be an individual parent, whether it be a couple who's had their child missing, because it all depends on the situation of why they are. But it's private clients, primarily. We want to get to the point where we're actually recognised by the government and recognised by the authorities and then start changing those rules with them to change their policies, change their procedures, and then start working alongside us. But until we actually grow, we've only been in the UK for a year now. So we've got a lot of growing to do before they will recognise us. How difficult is it to get a court order so you can rescue a child? 
court orders, they only exist at parental abduction. And that works under the international, uh, the Hague Convention on International Child Reduction. That's when one parent will kidnap a child and go abroad. Now, a lot of people mistake a parent kidnapping their child as a safe abduction. I've seen these abductions go through to the point where harm has been caused to the child and even harm caused to the child, if not death, and to the parent themselves as well, just to get a mental play over the parent that's been left behind. Every case that I've dealt with with parental abductions, there's always been mental health issues involved and psychological issues involved. There's a lot of investigating that we do when before taking on a case, and that's to both parents to ensure that we're doing the right thing and making sure that we're actually supporting the right person in case someone's actually leaving a dangerous situation in the first place. So when it comes to the court order itself, basically, the parent that's left behind, they have to go through the process of getting full custody. And then the Hague Convention itself is an entire system that works for the parent, in theory, but a lot of these systems are broken. As they go through that system, as long as the country that the child has been kidnapped to is part of the Hague Convention, then they can get a return order. And within a 12-month period, that child is supposed to be returned back to child's habitual residence, which is the original location that they was kidnapped from. It doesn't work very often when you're going through the Hague system. The orders will be given out, but then you've got countries that the child has been kidnapped to that won't enforce those orders. Therefore, that child will never get brought back. So when it comes to getting a court order, it's not us getting a court order, it's a parent getting a court order. And if we take on a parent's abduction after doing full investigations to make sure it's the right case and that it's actually the right side of the law and that parent's got that return order, once we've located the child, that's when it turns into a close protection phase because the parent that has that order has the right to pick up that child. Therefore, we protect that, ch- that parent and that child to make sure that they're extracted without any harm coming to them. Which countries have you rescued children from? The first case that I, uh, I actually took on was Lebanon. That was probably one of the biggest cases that I ever took on. That's what, where I got a name for myself within the industry. That was the first case I took on, but the second case I completed. So I've got Lebanon, Germany, Japan twice. I've got Ukraine, Spain, Norway. I've got two recoveries inside England uh, to date, Switzerland, Monaco and France. There's a few more being knocked around in there as well. Well, you've certainly been busy. How much planning does a successful rescue mission require? The planning is quite in-depth. We have a very short amount of time to come up with the entire plan of an operation. Within a two-week period, we need to learn the outlay of a city wherever we work, and that's our main area of operation. So we've got about two weeks to learn that better than we know our hometowns. We need to know so many details about our city and where every single entity that could work against us actually is. So the planning goes into the finest of details. If you come to a junction in the road and you've got three ways to go, we will check out every single way. We work out timings down to, to milliseconds and we work out what possibilities could go wrong. That's just the planning phase for that. Then on top of that, at the same time, you've got to work on the surveillance phase. You've got to work on the actual documental phase, which is the documents and all of the IT research and every bit of research that we've got going on. And within a four-week period, we have to have the entire picture laid out which in essence, for a lot of other companies, that could be months of work ahead of them. It's very detailed. like. So typically, how many people are in your operation teams? Dependent on the operation itself and dependent on how complexity of it and the danger side. It depends on the location of it. We average anywhere between two to five people. Two people for the main phases of the operation, which is the planning and preparation phase. We got five phases total. We also have people working back at home, which are not in the operational side. And then we'll bring in more operators for the actual recovery side of things, because a lot of these missions, it's not a case of just the parent. We don't just work primarily in parental abductions, which seems to become a focus quite often because of the mistake of a parent's abduction being a safe abduction. We also work in very dangerous situations going against serious organized crime elements and entities like this. So we're talking about five people on the ground at the time, and then we'll have a team back home for about three to four people working on the on the computer side of things. So what motivates people to abduct children? So like I said, abduction in itself and kidnapping in itself is broken down into multiple elements. Prime reasons, they could be a runaway. It could be a problematic child. It could be a child that's in a very bad situation at home and wants to get out of that situation. So you've got the runaway children that just run away from home primarily to get away from a situation they don't want to be in. They usually end up coming back. This happens a lot in care homes as well. Then you've got your kidnapping elements. The kidnapping side of things could be a parental abduction. It could be from an entity for kidnap and ransom, which wants to ransom the child for money. And then you've got your organized crime elements, which goes into sex trafficking. And then obviously you've got your parental abduction side as well. So it's broken down into multiple reasons. So Jay, how dangerous is your work? 
dependent on the country and depending on where we are, it can go through to the extent of being not very dangerous at all because you're blending into normal society in a Western civilization to the extremes of actually being in the same sort of situation as what an individual in a war zone can be. Abductions that we're willing to take on, we would go to places like Libya, Iraq and Afghanistan. So when even Syria, when you've got those sort of elements involved, then that's when we're going in. And that's where our hostile experience comes into play, because we go in as a full-blown private military unit with weapons, body armors, armored vehicles, and that's all protect the client to make sure that our guys are actually secure on the ground. And then we'll use local entities. At the same time as that, when you've got Lebanon, obviously it's blending into Western society versus Eastern society. And then at the same time as that, you're actually in a very hostile situation because we was going up against Hezbollah. But then uh, obviously the other entities is that there's been many times where I've actually slept on the streets as a homeless person just to be able to get eyes on the target in a Western country. And then your main threats would be some drunk coming out of a bar at nighttime and causing problems. So it varies. So there's an element of undercover work involved in what you do. The majority of it is undercover work. It's all very low-key blending into society. It's all sneaky-beaky. You have to blend into the situation. You get to the position where you're in-country and you have to create your cover stories in-country to be able to cover you for the next entity. For example, when I was in the Ukraine, I had to. I spent two weeks to create a cover story, being very covert, and everything that I was telling was based on that cover story to create the element of when I got myself detained on the border purposely to find out what assets they had on the border. They questioned me for one hour, and then I questioned them for four hours because my cover story was already put in place. It's all about using everything around you to your actual full availability and making it work. Everything's very low-key. We get to the point where if we have to use violence, that's us failing out of job because this is brains of a brawn rather than anything else. Who actually rescues the child physically? depend on what happens and the reasons why that child's actually gone missing will depend on who actually doesn't. If it's uh, an organized crime element, then obviously we were going through into, if we were in a hostile area, for example, and we know for a fact that law enforcement are not going to help us. If we're in a, in, in a country where we've got entities that what will help us, such as law enforcement, such as Interpol or anyone like that, if anyone's available to be able to help us there, then they will be able to assist us in actually going in and rescuing that child. So they will do actually going into the buildings and then we'll follow up and then we'll recover the children as a guarantor for the parent. On a parent's abduction, a parent will always pick up their own child. And the reason for that is because they're the ones with the legal court documents on their side. And if we were to touch it, that would be classed as kidnapping. They have the legal right to actually pick up their own child. So, Jay, how many children have you rescued so far? Today, it's 17. And that's working from 2012 until now. Our last case was only two weeks ago. Primarily, since I started in 2012, I was working part-time. In the aspect of my money would be made by going over to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I'll be contracting out there. Then I'll get a four-week leave period after about three months. And then in that four weeks, I'll be doing a recovery, and then I'll go back, and then maybe I'll do one a year. Since we have came out to the UK, I've quit Afghanistan and Iraq, and I focus on this full-time now. Well, I must commend you for your work. Very important stuff you're doing. So you're also an author. What is your book called, and what is it about? So my book is called Angel in the Shadows. The story of Angel in the Shadows is my first case that I took on. It's my introduction into the child recovery industry. It's the real accurate events, and it's all as it happened throughout the entire time that I was in Lebanon. Of the case of rescuing a mother and child that was kidnapped by and held against their will by a father that was connected to Hezbollah, and they were under Hezbollah protection. So what other interests do you have? My prime interest is turning the child recovery industry into a free service. First of all, Obviously, the free service itself has to exist due to the fact that right now there is nobody looking for people's parents. Whenever a child goes missing, the majority of the time by law enforcement, the class is a low to a medium risk. And the very rare occasion of getting put into a high risk, and that's only when they've got solid evidence that a child is actually in imminent danger. So that's a rare occasion for it to happen. This gives them about 48 hours to actually work on the case before they have to move on to something else. And the way that it works at the moment is that the police end up with a chain of phone calls from one area to the next area to the next area. And if that becomes international, it's one area to the next area to the next area internationally and then through all of their areas. And nothing ever comes back. So it's literally just waiting for the public to actually pass on information back. So by turning this into a free service, the entire concept of what we're trying to achieve is to create the people's company. And creating a people's company with a population of 7.8 billion people on the planet, our goal is to get a million people to donate £2. 
we can get a million people to donate two pound, that gives us four to six cases per month for the next two to three years. And that'll give us two to three years to actually raise more money. And if we're able to raise more money in that time, we can then up the numbers of cases that we take on per month, which means training more teams. It means continuing to actually grow the company and get these numbers changed. Now, changing the numbers statistically, that makes the government have to start thinking and questioning what is going on and then changing their policies. And then it also puts us in, in line with the law enforcement to actually work alongside us as professional advisors towards them. So, Jay, how can people contact you? Multiple ways. We're on most social media platforms. And we've also got the website, which is pegasus-ops.com. All of our links on there uh, on the, are on the website. So we've got all of our social media links. I do a lot of TikTok lives these days to explain to people and build up that relationship. So in our attempt to raise awareness, because there's not many people aware that there is this alternative service available. And obviously the website itself has got the news articles that we're pushing out. It's got podcast links. It's also got um, our testimonials from previous clients and donation link button. And also we're creating a shop shortly, um, which I'm hoping to go live very soon. Um, which is going to be selling merchandise and the profits from the book, profits from the merchandise, it all goes to raising funds to actually take on these cases. Currently, I've got eight cases that are open cases and six of those, they need funding. So um, we've got to work very hard to be able to try to raise that money. Well, I wish you every success in your endeavours. Jay in Shropshire, UK, thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, mate. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Another In Conversation podcast coming soon.